Welcome to the Think Podcast, the show that tackles impossible questions from a biblical perspective with your host, Joel Sedicate. And now, get ready to think. All right, welcome back to another episode of the Think Podcast with Joel Sedicate. I'm Joel Sedicate. And this is the show that tackles impossible questions from a biblical perspective to help you explain, share, and defend the Christian message. Now, I have people ask me all the time, every single day, every minute of every day, Joel, how'd you get so well-educated? Man, you must have had some amazing professors in college. I'm telling you what, your undergrad professors must have been really amazing for you to come out as well-educated as you are. Okay, I don't really have people ask me that. But if they did... If they did, I would mention today's guest right up there at the top of the list for uh, some of the best thinkers that I've been privileged to study under, to learn under. I'll tell you more about who that is in just a minute. But first, let me ask you today's impossible question. Is it possible that Marxism, including communism, socialism, and their offshoots, is not merely harmful, but actually inspired by the prince of demons, by the devil himself? In this episode, which may very well become our most controversial episode of the Think Podcast ever, I'm going to interview um, one of my professors from undergrad, and we're going to dig in to the life and work of Karl Marx and his infernal legacy that he left behind and the peril that is imminent in our civilization due to its ongoing presence. Specifically, we're going to talk about Marx's personal life, uh, some of the demonic poetry that he wrote, his hatred of religion, and what was behind that. We'll talk about why communism and atheism seem so intertwined, and how Marx's relationships, especially with Friedrich Engels, fueled his mission. Um, We're also going to talk about the lingering impact of Marxism on our society and Western civilization and its connection between the different movements of our time, the LGBTQ movement, environmentalist movement, the feminist movement, and how Marxism has not only transformed society, but still poses a dire threat to us today. So who could I possibly bring on to talk about this fascinating and very important subject? Well, I'm going to bring on Dr. Paul Kengor. Dr. Kengor is a political science professor from Grove City College, and he's the executive director of the Institute for Faith and Freedom, which is a conservative think tank and policy center. Dr. Kengor is also a visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution on War, Revolution, and Peace at Stanford University, and he joins me today to talk about his incredible book, The Devil and Karl Marx, Communism's Long March of Death, Deception, and Infiltration. Without any further ado, let me just welcome enthusiastically Dr. Paul Kengor to the ThinkPod. Dr. Kengor, how are you? Thank you, Joel. Good to be in, in touch with a former student, and it's um, this will be fun. Well, maybe not fun, but uh, <laughs> right. right? I mean, in as much as this topic could be, uh, it, it's not a fun. It's not a fun topic. It's pretty pretty sad and depressing, actually. It is. It is. Um, and yet, I couldn't help but get a sense as I was reading your book, you had to have had a little bit of fun with it. I mean, just your language is, um, uh, forgive the comparison, it's almost Martin Luther-esque in, mm. in some of the, uh, the, 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 just the strong language. I mean, you really pull no punches when you're describing this ideology. Um, wh- wh- why is that? Uh, you, you seem, to, you seem to, to use that strong language. What, what motivates that as you're writing? Yeah, and I'll tell you, Joel, I, I had probably the only negative review I had on the book was somebody who reviewed it for National Review, and he accused me of um, he well, I was going to say accused. He didn't he didn't like that I had used that kind of str- that kind of strong language, and really? the, the very polemical language, and and said you know if, if I could have used more because he said the book is very scholarly, filled with footnotes and yeah. filled with sources, and was impressed by all that. But he said I'm not going to be able. I'm not going to be converting people from the Marxist side, right? I should use a more scholarly tone throughout. But, you know, I've been doing that for 30 years, <laughs> and, and, they, and they don't read those books. They, 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 they don't make any impact. I, I, did, I did a book for Harvard University Press called Reagan in a World Transformed. In fact, it might have been with one of your classmates, Joel. It was Jeff Chidester. 
of mm. the University of Virginia, very thoughtful scholar. And the book was Harvard University Press. We had an equal number of conservatives, equal number of liberals, equal number of Democrats and Republicans. Uh, Jul uh, Julian Zelitzer of CNN, uh, who writes a lot for CNN, he's of Princeton, Kyron Skinner, Beth Fisher, but really good people. And, and if you go there right now, there is one review on Amazon. <laughs> one review. It came out like five or six years ago. And and now the the devil and Karl Marx, I think, has like twelve hundred reviews or something wow. like that. But but you but it's um first of all, I I've I've you know been there, done that, and I write books like that. This book isn't like that, right? That's that's not what it is. And he also right. felt that the book was too religious. Well, it's a religious publisher, it's tan books, right? By the way, lesson number one in kind of young people writing book reviews, never criticize a never criticize a book for for um for being what it is <laughs> right so if it was only this and this but that's not what it is right. and, and but more than that and the forward to the book is written by michael knowles who's who's really excellent and he has a great line in there joel where he says something like you know conservatives have said for years that that communism doesn't work because it distorts markets right well, yeah, it distorts markets, but it doesn't work because because of more than that. It's not just wrong economically, right? It's not just wrong p politically, even ideologically. It's wrong from an anthropological point of view, mm. a philosophical point of view, and, and especially from a spiritual point of view. It's a strictly yeah. materialistic philosophy. And so all these years, I mean, I was born in uh, 1966, graduated from college, 1989-90, when the Berlin Wall fell. Joel, I thought we were done with this stuff. I mean, I thought we had defeated this ideology. And to see it coming along now, it's, it's, it, in the surge that it's having in this resurgent way, with all the scholarly books that have been done over the years by Richard Pipes and Robert Conquest and Applebaum, all the think tank reports and everything else, it's time to take the gloves off and just say, this is an ideology that killed over 100 million people. And if you read the Communist Manifesto, it's an, it's an inane, insane book. I mean, anybody who reads it, it's not long. Like, I've got, it, 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 it's, it's not long. I mean, it's very, very short. If you just yeah, read it I've from a it practical point of view, you're going to think to yourself, how could anybody take this seriously? And for Marxists that are watching right now, um, keep in mind this book. I, I've had people say this, Joel, and then I'll let you jump in. Sorry, I don't want to ramble here, but I've had um, I've had Marxists say to me over the years, "Well, at least you could give Marx credit for um, accurately pointing out the deplorable working conditions in the factories, right? In in the 1800s." Okay, well, first of all, he wasn't the only one saying that. Okay. Um, but just because you could point out that that's wrong, you know, that it doesn't mean that he's got every, everything else right. And more than that, if you're telling me as a Marxist that the one thing that we ought to hail is that Marx had diagnosed the mid 19th century working conditions, factory floor conditions, right? Why are you following this in the year 2021? Right. I mean, we're not in 1848 anymore. Right. We're Those not conditions even aren't there. Which is why, and I know you want to go here, a lot of the Marxists today have forgotten all about the factory floor and the farm. They know that doesn't work. They're not even talking about economics and class. They're talking about culture, culture, culture. They're talking about sexuality. They're talking about gender. They're in an altogether different area. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Marx's book not only doesn't work, but it's completely antiquated, completely antiquated. So, you know, enough of enough pussyfooting around about this. Th th this is this is a you read this book, it is a ridiculous, I, the entire communist theory may be summed up in a single sentence, said Marx and Engels. All right, everybody's listening, right? Okay, what is it? They said this, a single sentence? Yeah, 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 they did. Abolition of private property. All right. Non-starter. <laughs> I mean, you know, you, a five-year-old could tell you that you're going to have to massacre people by the millions to do that, right? What are we even talking about this for? This is a I, I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to sound disrespectful. This is a really stupid book, really dumb ideas. I can't believe people have ever taken this seriously, and they still take it seriously in 2021. And 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 and, and maybe maybe people you know need hit upside the head with this, right? Not in a literal sense, okay? But you know maybe, maybe it, 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 someone's got someone's got to have a you know heart to heart 
talk with them here, right? Yeah. A, a, a come to Jesus moment, right? Yeah. Come here, my friend. I sit down here and listen to Do you really think that you can do this? Huh? Right. Do you really? If so, you must not know anything about the real world. Anyway. So you've written you've written books on, you know, Ronald Reagan. I remember when you when you wrote uh was it God and Ronald Reagan? Sure. And you know, that was this well, what seemed to me, it seemed to be a very popular book, huge hit. And then you wrote, uh, I remember you had you, you had a, a series of these, God and Hillary Clinton, which that mm -hmm. one, you know, that one made me raise my eyebrow a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and you know, you've gone down the line, and now here you come to Karl Marx, and it's not God and Karl Marx, right? which you might expect. Oh, well, sure, if he can write God and Hillary Clinton, he can write God and Karl Marx. But no, it's the devil and Karl Marx. What, what you, you mentioned that you're, you're, uh, you're so upset to see this ideology coming back, Dr. Ken Gore. What was it about this particular moment in time that made you say, I need to write this book? This is the one. I'm not going to write about, you know, uh, any of the other, so, uh, maybe one of its offshoots, you know, maybe the, the, the BLM riots or the, you know, the Antifa movement. No, I'm going to write about Karl Marx. I'm going back to the fountainhead here. Why this book at this particular time? Well, and, and that's a really good line of question there. So, uh, I my first real book published book was God and Ronald Reagan the year 2004 other than I, I published my dissertation a few years earlier but uh, that was a bestseller did really well and it was published by Harper Collins then I did God and George W Bush and Harper Collins asked me to do another God and book as they called it a different person I said no I don't want to do that person and, and I don't want to just write these kinds of books and I said, I said, but there is somebody that I think has a great kind of really interesting faith story. It's someone I disagree with. Um, I'd like, it was actually, actually they, I said, I'd like to do God and Bill and Hillary Clinton. And the editor said, oh man, right? <laughs> and, and, and in the end, he, since Hillary Clinton, this was 2006, 2007, since she was the one running for president, um, he said, let's focus it just on Hillary and you could bring Bill into it. So Bill's a key part of it. But the key there, Joel, so I said, I think it would be interesting to do one of these books on someone I disagree with and who's from the religious left. By the way, at that point, Hillary Clinton, I could say, I could surprise people with that book. She was, um, I could surprise conservatives. She was very good on religious liberty and she was against same-sex marriage, right? Wow. Yeah, completely against it. Completely flipped in 2012 not exaggeration to check the dates right after the November 2012 election and mm -hmm. um, and Barack Obama had flipped in in May 2012 so I so I focused on in her case a religious left kind of social justice pro-choice Christian right and and the one of the criticisms I got from people on the left was wow this guy's actually surprisingly very fair to her but he focuses too much on abortion <laughs> right. Well, to me, that's the elephant in the living room. Right. I, I mean, it's but but if I was going to do a book on the faith of Karl Marx, it wasn't going to be God and Karl Marx because Marx didn't believe in God. Right. Hillary Clinton believes in God. George W. Bush does. Ronald Reagan did. And and Karl Marx, I say that Karl Marx believed in the devil. Well, this is a deeper theological point. And as you know from the book, I'm very careful with this. He, he, I say in the book, even though other people have said this, um, I can't say whether or not the guy is a Satanist, right? Um, you would think that a Satanist would, would, would be somebody who didn't believe in God. Although then again, unfortunately, I had to, I had to look into some of this garbage and writing this book. There are Satanists who hail Satan as a philosopher or as like a symbol without actually believing in the supernatural, Right. There right. are, um, I quote somebody, in fact, probably his most respected biographer from the 60s and 70s, Robert Payne, who said it did seem at times like Marx was possessed, like he, like he seemed to know that he was doing the works of evil, like he was doing the works of the devil. And I say, I don't know that. I, I, I'm not, you know, the, to quote Barack Obama, that's above my pay grade, right? I, I, can't, I can't say that. But what Marx wrote about the devil, what he said about the devil the, the poems that he wrote, the plays that he wrote, especially in contrast to what he wrote about God and in, 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 in religion, what he wrote about the devil is chilling. And I say very carefully in the start of this book, we never want to overstate things, okay? But you don't want to understate them either. And so my goal was just put it out there and, you know, kind of let this fact speak for themselves. 
it's chilling enough. And the book probably should have been called The Devil and Communism, because it's much more, as you saw, Joel, about communism generally, Lenin, Mao, um, the, the Frankfurt School, all these other different, uh, you know, Saul Alinsky even. Yeah. You talk about Saul Alinsky, he wasn't a communist, but he was pro-communist, he was yeah. a socialist, and, and started off one of his books in the, in the beginning with an acknowledgement to Lucifer, who he called uh, the first and most glorious of all rebels, right? Right. who won for himself his own kingdom. So there yeah. you have Alinsky. I've got and his book on my shelf too. Yeah. yeah, and he's kind of referring to Marx there as, as a symbol. Mikhail Bakunin did that as well, and Bakunin mm -hmm. was close to Marx, at least for a while, until Marx did what he did everybody, um, you know, eventually called him all kinds of filthy names and, and mm. spit bile at him, and Marx wasn't able to keep very many friends. But but so in the, in the case of Marx, it would really be the devil and Karl Marx. And, yeah. and that phrase, too, obviously, I'm picking up on on a common phrase, right? The devil and Daniel Webster, mm -hmm. um, the devil in the lost city, right? Yeah, that's kind of a common name. So you wouldn't call this uh, God and Karl Marx, the devil and Karl Marx, unfortunately, in the case of Marx, fits to some yeah. degree. Well, and you see this reflected in his personal life, too. I mean, um, as I'm reading, I was hoping, Dr. Kengur, for an, a, a definitive statement. Yes, Marx was directly inspired by Satan. Here's the seance he went to where he right. received this. You know, here's here's the moment. There wasn't that, but yeah. but Not there that we was, know. well, uh, fair enough, fair enough. Right. Um, but there was a strong tendency in his personal life, in his writings. I'm talking about his poetic writings, his, his the literature that he created that wasn't, you know, his his official work on communism, if you can call it work. Um, but it was it was his personal life and his loves and his desires and the expressions of those. You know, Jesus said what what's in the heart will come out of the mouth. And and in Marx's case, it came out of the pen. And um, can, can you describe that for us? Uh, where do we see satanic, demonic, dark, uh, malevolent uh, forces, for lack of a better word, at play in his um, in his own thought life? Yeah, let me say here, too, that I give examples in the book of um, places like the, the the Potesti prison in Romania, which was the communist prison for religious people. And, and there they did do black masses, right? Um, they did do uh, mock crucifixions. They would take priests and force them to, to consecrate um, the Eucharist communion would take feces, and 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 for, form it into bread and put put urine in a chalice, and and have and have prisoners come by and defecate and urinate on 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 priests and religious prisoners when they were tied to crosses. They referred to Christ as the as the great idiot crucified. They referred to to Mary as as uh, the great whore. So really vile stuff. I mean I mean you'll you'll see in this book quite literally the satanic right. Black masses, seances, yeah. flat out paganism, and worse. It's hard to read. Examples. I will say that middle middle section where you get into that stuff, um, not directly dealing with Marx, but his his followers. You know the, yeah, the people Marxism. who are, yeah. Uh, it's very very so. Reader beware. It's, it's important to read, but it's very yeah. difficult. And, and, and see, and anybody that reads that, that that's why the criticism of uh, the reviewer in National Review, right? That um, I could have written this book in the same kind of scholarly. I had stuff like this, the stuff from Pastor Richard Wormbron in The Devil and Karl Marx. I used that in God and Ronald Reagan. Mm. Um, and you know what? No one on the left even read it. Mm. They didn't even read it. They don't even read it. They are so closed-minded. They don't even read it. But if you could just get them to sit down and open their mind and use their tolerance and diversity that they claim, if they just read that stuff, the verbatim statements from like the prison of Potesti, they've got to come away from this, Joel, and say, okay, all right, uh, this Ken Gore guy is a right winger and everything, but this is, the, we have to agree this is evil. I mean, if this isn't evil, I don't know what is, right? right? Uh, but in Marx's life, yeah, I mean, the darkness, there was so much darkness. Uh, I could give example after example from his writings, from his personal life. He had a favorite, his kids even said this, he had a favorite line. It was, it was a line from Goethe's Faust, Faust, the Faustian bargain. Mm -hmm. And the quote was actually from, from the Mephistopheles character, the demon, the devil character. 
And that line is everything that exists deserves to perish. Yeah. Right. Everything that exists deserves to perish. Now, if they ask Joel, you or me, hey, give me a favorite quote, right? Or, or Ronald Reagan, George W. Bush. Right. I could even do this for Hillary Clinton. Uh, they'd pick an Old Testament verse, right? A quote from the New Testament. Or, you know, Reagan, hey, give us something that's not religious. He said, well, okay. Um, when I was governor of California, right, there was a plaque on my desk. It said, um, there's no credit to how much a man can achieve if he doesn't mind who, who gets the. There's no limit to how much a man can achieve if he doesn't mind who gets the credit, mm -hmm. right? Took that plaque, put it on his office desk at the White House. Nice positive statement, right? Be not afraid, right? Statement like that. Marx, oh, yes, I have a favorite line. Everything that exists deserves to perish, right? Nice. And, and, and that's fully consistent with um, lines throughout the manifesto. Uh, pages 383 to 384 of my book, and I know the exact pages because I've gone there a bunch of times, and he says, communism seeks, I think I have it bookmarked, yeah, uh, Marx in the Manifesto said the communism represents the, uh, the most radical rupture in traditional relations. Marx in the fan Manifesto, communism seeks to abolish the present state of things. Mm. I mean, can you imagine that, yeah. right? Uh, end of the Communist Manifesto. The communists openly declare that their ends can be attained only by the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. Forcible overthrow of yeah. all existing social conditions. So the people who think, uh, oh, yeah, Marxism is a pretty good idea. If you just get the markets right, if you don't distort the markets, right, if you could just, um, you know, redistribute wealth like the, it, this is talking about blowing up the world, man, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You abolish the present state of things. The, um, Marx in a letter to Arnold Rouge called for, quote, the ruthless criticism of all that exists. In his essay declaring religion the opiate of the masses, the criticism of religion is the beginning of all criticism. That essay uses the word criticism 29 times. Mm. The only word that Marx used more than criticism was abolition. But again, that line from Goethe's Faust, everything that exists deserves to perish. Yeah. So it's a really, it's a destructive, very truly revolutionary philosophy, which is why when you hear somebody say, and Joel, you and I get this, right? When you hear somebody say, um, we are trained Marxists. Well, here I'm quoting Patrice Colors, right? Yeah, Patrice Colors of uh, the founder of Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. This is her memoirs. Uh, Alicia and I, Alicia Garza and I, she said, we are trained Marxists. We are super versed in ideological theories. We spent a year reading everything from Marx, Mao, Lenin. It's all in here. When you hear her say something like that, okay, that's a big deal. All right. It's a red flag, huh? right? Pun intended, right? I mean, that's something when people say, oh, come on, you guys, you guys are just anti-communists and you don't like that she's a Marxist. So you're using that to attack her ideas or movement. No, if her movement was was about um, stopping police abuse, I'd be all for that. Right. right? Uh, but but no, the, you, you go to the website and it said things like um, comrades um about um, abolishing the quote western prescribed nuclear family structure yeah. marx and engels wrote in the communist manifesto about quote abolition of the family unquote mm -hmm. right abolition a lot, of the family. a lot of similarities there yeah even yeah abolition of the family um even the most radical flare up of this infamous proposal of the communists unquote so this is um there's nothing more revolutionary than communism and this is what people today don't get you you deal with somebody who's a hardcore marxist this is an entirely different worldview, um, materialism versus the supernatural, atheism versus belief in God. Um, it, it's an entirely different view of man. Yeah. They do not see human beings as the Christian does, as made in the image of God, the, the Imago Dei, right? They really see people as cogs in the machine, as, uh, as the masses. So, so um, it's very important. Help me with that then, because... You know, you're going to run into this problem. Um, I, I do a lot of work with apologetics, and so I'm interacting with different worldviews. Um, and, you know, you, you really do run into this problem when it comes to atheism in that it makes man essentially equivalent to the beasts, you know, dirt, 
Uh, use right. use your fellow human beings however you want. And yet it also elevates man to a god because it says, you look, we need an all-powerful state, you know, with yeah. a, a dictator at the top, and he's going to control the markets or she's going to control, you know, the markets and society. And now that there's been this switch, as you mentioned, from the means of production to the means of cultural production, um, you know, we're going to control the the media and entertainment and and social media. And so it, 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 it seems to be elevating man to godlike status, but also at the exact same time denigrating man down to, you know, dirt, to slime, to a beast. So so yeah. what's the proper context to view Marxists' view of man? Well, Whitaker Chambers said that the mistake of the Marxists is the mistake made first in the Garden of Eden, right? Ye shall be as gods. Oh. So, but but really what's going on is man is sort of the masses and the state is the god, right? The, you know, the, the mm. regime is the god. And the state is made up of, re, of a regime, as Lenin wrote in, in his classic work, What is to be Done? The, you know, in order to get communism, you, you need a vanguard, you need a cadre, you need a group. You need a group of individuals to run it. So those individuals, so the likes of Lenin, Stalin, and others, they become in a way, in a way like the gods, right? You know, they're, you know, they're, they're running everything, even though they claim that they don't believe in religion and they make fun of religion. Ronald Reagan used to say communism, that religion of theirs, right? They, so they end up treating it like, like a religion. Mikhail Gorbachev said they, they would treat communism and the manifesto and these other things like as, as a series of canonical texts and Marx right. and Engels, I quote them in this book, Engels even wrote this letter to Marx around 1847, where they're talking about the Communist Manifesto. At that time, they were writing it. And Engels says, give a little more thought, Carl, to our communist confession of faith. Right. I think we should drop the catechetical form and call it just the manifesto. Right. So the communist confession of faith. So, so yeah, they, they ended up, they end up treating it like a religion and, and also to this very low view of humanity of people, this applied to, to Marx's views on evolution and race too. I wrote a piece that's posted at our Institute for Faith and Freedom website, Marx on, Marx on, Christ, Marx on Christianity, Judaism and evolution slash race. Uh, it's a piece that maybe you could post. And he had, um, this gets back to Patrice Colors, right? The, the founder of Black Lives Matter. Patrice ought to know, and I guarantee you she doesn't, because she wouldn't have learned this in the places where they learn glowingly about Marxism. She should know that Karl Marx was a terrible racist. I mean, a terrible racist. Very, very offensive. Uh, that's it. That's the article. I gave, uh, I gave a talk last week, PowerPoint, on this, Joel, and I had up on my PowerPoint Marx's statements about Jews and his statements about black people. And my audience there, I, I, from what I looked carefully around the room, I didn't see anybody who was black. And because I thought, um, I can't, if there's anybody in this room who's black, I can't read this, um, even abbreviating it. I mean, I wouldn't say the full N word that Marx said. I would have said like an N word. But even that, even abbreviating it, I would have felt I would have felt like I was embarrassing the person. Yeah. And so my audience, which I think was entirely white, I said, here, take a look, read, read what this says on my PowerPoint, read what this says. Want to take a picture of it with your phone? Go ahead and take a look at it. It's very, very offensive. Yeah. And his view, this sprung from the fact that that he thought that black people were lower on the evolutionary scale than white people. So if human beings weren't created by God, but just evolved from this primordial soup, he believed that white people were higher on the evolutionary scale and blacks were closer to apes. And he said he re he referred to his son to his son-in-law as who his son-in-law was Paul Lafargue, who was partly Cuban. I mean, who oh, knows yeah. how much? Who cares? But yeah. Marx Marx cared. Yeah. Engels cared. There's a letter between Marx and Engels where they're trying to deduce with scientific accuracy how much Negro blood Paul had. Yeah. One eighth, one twelfth. They're examining the, the his cranial formation of his head. That's a phrase they use. They're examining the shape of his hair, and uh, really, eff really offensive stuff. And Marx called him a gorilla, ne ne uh, ne Negrillo. Marx called him Negrillo, the gorilla. Uh, Engels made this really nasty statement in a letter to to, to Paul's 
wife, Marx's daughter. So, uh, Paul was running for office in a local district in Paris that contained a zoo. And Engels said, oh, well, given in his, in his quality of that of a N-word, that is one step closer to monkeys than the rest of us. Oh. He should make an outstanding representative of that district. And, and to think, did this hurt Paul's self-esteem? Did it hurt Paul's wife's feeling? Right. Oh, yeah. And I could tell you, getting to the dark side of Marx, as you know, having read the book, I have never met another figure in all of history who had two daughters who committed suicide in suicide packs with their husbands. <sighs> and uh, that that's Karl Marx. That's yeah. Karl Marx's family. And uh, Paul, that son-in-law, was... was um, he committed suicide in a suicide pact with with Marx's daughter. So I very, can see very dark, very dark. At, at the at the beginning of this episode, you said this is not going to be fun. <laughs> this right, is not right. a fun. And you know, I certainly, I, I certainly don't envy you um, having had to do the research that you did. And this, it's a very well researched book. I mean, it, like you said, it's very scholarly. Um, but well, I've man, known about it for years. It torments me. Yeah. And, and it, depending on, I'm trying to remember which class you had with me. We might have read some of this stuff on Marx's personal life in uh, in our modern civ class, Yuma 302 at Grove City College. Yeah, uh, so. People like um, Paul Johnson, the conservative historian, he wrote on this in his book Intellectuals over 30 years ago. So this stuff has been out there. Yeah. Um, I mean, I went a lot further and I dug a lot more and got, got even more information. But for me, what can be even more tormenting is knowing what I know about these guys and knowing that 99% of the people in our modern universities are being taught that socialism and some forms of communism are okay or cool or acceptable, or at the least, what's actually bad is anti-communism, right? That, yeah, that's what's bad. It, knowing that these people aren't knowing any of this. I, I, mean, I don't support the cancel culture, but if you're going to cancel anybody, why in the world wouldn't you cancel Marx right. for his statements on, on black people, women, and Jews alone? Yeah. Uh, Ronald Reagan is, is being canceled all over the place for a statement he made to Nixon in 1972 uh, in a phone call. I've written about this, which is completely out of character for Reagan. And we're not really even sure what it means. I, I, I mean, take that Reagan statement and put it on steroids and, and then do it 100 times over. That's Karl Marx. Right. Right? Why are we canceling Karl Marx? Because because yeah. the young people aren't learning any of this. P Patrice Colors isn't learning any of this. And and you know the whole thing really. I mean, we talk about the the satanic character of Marxism. And I think what a lot of people are looking for is the same thing I was looking for. That smoking gun. This is when it was inspired. But you can see the. Um, I, I love that allusion you made earlier to the garden. Uh, you shall be as gods. You'll be like God. You can see this sort of this impulse within Marxism to just um, define reality the way we want to define it. So if there's no God above us, we're all the product of this evolutionary process, this blind chance, then there is nothing sacred or God given about our institutions. And right. there's nothing sacred about my neighbor. He or she is just um, uh, another ape. And I can sort of scientifically figure out how far up or down the evolutionary ladder this person is. And then I can just use this person. I can define this person however I want, because functionally speaking, the, the, the state or whoever has the power really ultimately is, is God. And isn't that just the essence of you know, Satanism is not about worshiping Satan. It's about following his example, as you alluded to earlier. Yeah, and you know, Ronald Reagan said one of the worst words in all of Marxism is, is masses, right? Referring oh, to the yeah. people as the masses. Right. And uh, the, the uh, I've got, I think, behind me, yeah, the, uh, I wrote a book called A Pope and a President. And I opened that book with a quote from Pope John Paul II, December 25th, Christmas Day in 1978. He said, every person is unique precious and unrepeatable. And, and as Reagan said, uh, every, every human being is infinitely, literally more important than the state. States come and go. States don't have souls. Human beings have souls. Human beings can literally live forever throughout eternity. And so if to have an evil empire, as Reagan put it, a communist empire, denying people religious freedom or the right to learn about or worship God is is the most serious of sins 
yeah. because be, because it's denying human beings for, from eternity. But the Marxist, on the other hand, and this is why the Christian worldview is so so important. If you don't think that people are unique, precious, and unrepeatable, if you don't think they're made in the image of God, and you think that when you die you just become worm food, which is which is I mean you should something depressing. Read the eulogies at at uh, Marx's funeral, Marx's wife's funeral by by Friedrich Engels, right? Quoting Darwin and looking down at the body of the vivacious Jenny, Marx's wife, who's now worm food, right? And he gives this kind of dark. Well, you know, and sh now she returns to what she once was, and you just people the agony that they're in, not knowing is there any hope for the world. Yeah. That's the kind of despairing view of human beings that Marx and his wife uh, uh, taught, taught to their children as well. But it's completely different from the Christian worldview. And, and this gets to the killing in, the, in, in Marxism, communism. So it's no big deal to cart people off, put them on a train, take them away from their house, abolition of private property. Marx and Engels wrote in the Communist Manifesto, the entire communist theory may be summed up in the single sentence, abolition of private property. No big deal to go to the home of some family in Warsaw or uh, Budapest or Bucharest or St. Petersburg or whatever, kick them out of their house, take all their property, take their farm, and if they resist, put them on a train and cart them off to Siberia yeah. because in the end, they're just like, they're like cattle. Yeah. right they are just cogs in the machine there's right. nothing special about them every human being is not as ronald reagan put it a new person with new ideas new innovation new creativity you can make the world better one new person who if he becomes a farmer can feed another hundred people no each and every human being in the communist system is one more mouth that you need to redistribute income to right one more right. person that the state has to manage it's so, so for a state like communist china one child policy that's perfect because, well, we got too damn many people, right? Mm -hmm. What are we going to do with all these people? Who's going to feed them? Who's mm -hmm. going to feed them, right? Well, yeah. the, the conservative says um, they'll feed themselves, right? right? They're individuals. Yeah. They're entrepreneurs, yeah. right? Give them freedom. They'll free themselves, feed themselves, right? Oh, who's going to feed them all? Oh, we're, how are we going to collect enough money from the rich to feed them all? That's the kind of dark Marxist socialist worldview. It's a, it's a very negative outlook on human life. Well, and, and it eventually, I mean, uh, you see the, the sat satanic or devilish influence in it as well, don't you? Because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Hmm. And the, this all, doesn't this ideology lead to death? I mean, you look at China right now, their, their birth rate is well below replacement level. Right. So so now they are in this state where who's going to feed people? Who's going to keep them alive as the population ages? And, um, y you know, think about uh, the, the mass starvations in Eastern Europe as there weren't enough crops to go around. And I know some of that was intentional um, yeah. under these these uh, communist dictators. But the wages of sin is death. You can't adopt Satan's mentality and expect that. You know, you can't abandon God's laws for thriving and then expect you're going to thrive under that, correct? Yeah, and, and no ideology in history has produced as many deaths as, right. as Marxist ideology, as, as communist ideology. I open the book with, with, with two different poems, and the first one oh, yeah. is, um, is, is from the player. And Marx says there, let's see, I have it memorized. I should just try to say it at the top of my head. The Pale Maid in 1837. Thus heaven I forfeited, I know it full well, my soul once true to God is chosen for hell. That's pretty nasty. Yeah. But the other one, the player from 1841, Mark says, wrote, Look now, my blood-dark sword shall stab unerringly within thy soul. The hellish vapors rise and fill the brain, till, my, till I go mad and my heart is utterly changed. See the sword. The prince of darkness sold it to me. For he beats the time, that's the devil, and gives the signs. Ever more boldly, I play the dance of death. And as I say in the book, communism really is the dance of death. It's led to the deaths of over 100 million people in the 20th century alone. you got to take the dead from World War I and World War II and combine them and double them. To, to, to get close to the number of deaths by, by communist governments. And on regarding that mouths to feed China, one child policy, that 100 million people, those are people killed by starvation, sometimes deliberate starvation, um, famines, Holodomor, the Ukrainian famine. 
by people shipped off to Siberia who died by exposure to the elements or people who died by direct execution, purges, uh, by rifle firing squad. It includes you know, 15,000 to 18,000 people in Cuba that died under Fidel and Che from 1959 to, 1890, to 89. And it doesn't include the Black Book of Communism numbers, don't anyway. But about 100,000 people have tried to swim from Cuba to the United States since 1959. And the Harvard University Press book, The Black Book of Com Communism, estimates upwards of 40,000 of those people may have died from drowning. Wow. So you got these just incredible numbers of death. Talk about the dance of death. And it doesn't even include, and this gets to my point in child and uh, China and the one child policy, and how are we going to feed all these people? Uh, abortion right. in the communist countries was um, it was immediately legalized in Russia. And Lenin was writing about it in Pravda in June 1913, called for the immediate annulment of all laws against abortion. Really? Four years before he took over in 1917. And then wow. they made abortion fully legal in 1920. Joel, it got so out of control so quick, the number of abortions in atheistic communist Russia, that Stalin banned it. Because Stalin said we're we're not gonna we're not gonna have a country left wow. if this keeps up. And wow. after Stalin died, Khrushchev brought it back. Now Khrushchev, right, is supposed to be better than Stalin, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, Trotsky had even reprimanded Stalin. Conrad, you cannot be a good communist and ban abortion. Mm. And Khrushchev brought it back in. By the 1970s, this is incredible. By the 1970s, there were seven to eight million abortions per year. In the Soviet Union. Wow. Performed by full time, 24 7 abortion clinics. So, so you, so you, you didn't have the right to religion, to property, freedom of speech, but you had the right to abortion, baby. Wow. Right? Fully covered. Wow. We got you there. We got yeah. you there. Cuba as well. So, the number of abortions that took place, the so seven, eight million abortions per year in the Soviet Union in the, in the 1970s, I mean, that is. America post Roe v. Wade, we never got higher than about one and a half to two million. Mm -hmm. So they've lost, if you were to include all those lives, they've lost a hundred mil, hundred million plus people to, to abortion. To yeah, that alone. Incredible. So, the, so the, the death, the death that took place under communist governments in places like Bolshevik Russia, to this day in China, to this day in Cuba, to this day in North Korea, is really unfathomable. And I think more than anything else, that speaks to the diabolical nature of, of Marxist philosophy. So what, what you're describing right now is 20th century, the 20th century legacy. And there are huge gaps in populations that are missing as people disappeared, yeah. uh, their lives were snuffed out, and their, their would-be children are now not here on earth. What about in the 21st century? Because you talked about how, um, and this is, I, I mentioned up front that this is going to be potentially a controversial, like I'm from Chicago. Uh, so uh, Barack Obama is a bit of a sacred figure among some of the circles that I've run in. But you mentioned how his presidency really helped to transform society. And maybe you, if you could briefly, before we get to some of the, the uh, viewer questions, if you could briefly talk, I know this is a lot, about what did President Obama do to transform society and how do we see some of these movements today, these ideological societal movements, uh, how do we see their connection to Marxism and and where do you see things heading in the future? Well, with Obama, it was on the sexual cultural stuff okay. and, and that was... That's uh, really where the fundamental transformation of America, fundamental transformation of the United States of America, as he promised in Columbia, Missouri, right before the, the November 2008 election. That's really where the transformation has taken place. And, you know, the Obergefell decision in, in June 2015, which, of course, was decided by the Supreme Court, but which he completely supported. And, and in fact, I'll never forget, I was driving up uh, Route 79. It was the summertime and I was going to pick up one of my children from a from a from a Christian camp, a summer camp, and somebody called me and said, "You won't believe this, but the White House is quite literally illuminated in the colors of the rainbow flag." Right. And, and I said, "No, I, I, come on. Where, where, which kooky website are you getting that from?" 
but 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 it was and i that is really the symbol i think of the obama administration more than anything else so where the obama administration was truly transformative was on these sexual cultural issues and where where joe biden is today he just he just picked up from where obama had left off in 2016. so what would have been so Biden is really the third Obama term, or as maybe you call it, the first Hillary Clinton term. And he's even doing stuff now, especially on gender ideology stuff and gender transitioning and so forth, that um, that even Obama wasn't there yet at that point. But the but the but the breakthrough really took place in the Obama administration. And how to the extent that some of this is 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 connected to Marx, again, we could overstate things. We don't want to understate or over or overstate things. They did a book called Takedown, which came out in 2015. It was released one month before the Obergefell decision. And this is one of those books, Joel, where it's it's getting me canceled from you know speaking engagements and so forth by mm -hmm. people who haven't even read it. It's just so frustrating. Really? I mean, they'll they'll quote some obscure website. This happened to me with a group of academics from California um, in September of uh, 2020. They didn't even read the book. It, 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 but it is, it is, it is so discouraging when scholars who don't even read your work before <laughs> speaking out against. I mean, we're supposed to be academics. We're supposed to actually engage and look at what somebody wrote. Instead, they they put in this letter against me a two sentence description from a website I'd never even heard of. And it wasn't it wasn't an even accurate description of the book. It's just get the book. You can get on Amazon for like two dollars and twenty five cents. Oh, but 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 what I said in that book was that that socialists and communists have been trying to redefine the family mm -hmm. and and even marriage going back to the 1800s. And so in that book, I went through how all of that happened. And I noticed in the early 2000s, early 2000s. So at this point. The Defense of Marriage Act wasn't even seven or eight years old. The Defense of Marriage Act, for people who don't remember, every Democrat almost <laughs> in Congress joined every Republican almost right. in defining marriages between one man and one woman. Bill and Hillary Clinton supported that. Barack Obama supported it. All right. So where they all right now, whoop, complete 180. All right. In like 20 years, <laughs> like 1995 to, to, to 2015. So. Early 2000s, Obama was against same-sex marriage. Hillary Clinton was against same-sex. All the Democrats were, and but I read communist publications. This is what I do, right? Every day I read that. I check um, Communist Party USA's website, Trotsky Socialist Workers Party's website, People's World, which is the publication, the successor publication to the Daily Worker. And I started noticing Joel in the early 2000s. They were going bananas for same-sex marriage. Hmm. They were all in for same-sex marriage. And I thought, wow, look at this. The first time, Joel, that I saw the, the acronym LGBTQIA+, was in People's World. And I thought, I, what is, what's IA+. Plus? I later found out, you know, I was for intersex, A, asexual. The plus was for everything else mm -hmm. that, that followed. But, but so people listening are like, Wait, Ken Gore, Marx wrote about like uh, economics and class, right? And about factories and farms. So you're telling me that the communists were, were like cheerleaders for same-sex marriage? What does that have to do with, with Marx, right. right? Marx and Engels support gay marriage? No, of course they didn't. No, they couldn't even conceive of something like that. No one could have conceived of something like that until like, like, like the last 10 years. But, but the communists were on board for it because this allowed them, right, to to you know, abolish the family, abolition of the family. Right. To, to quote that one line again, communists everywhere support. This is the this is the last next to last paragraph of the communist manifesto. Everyone just remembers workers of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains. Mm -hmm. Marx and Engels quote: Communists everywhere support every revolutionary movement against the existing social and political order of things. Wow. So if if there's a movement to redefine the family, if there's a movement to redefine gender, if there's a movement to redefine marriage, and especially if you're an atheist and don't believe that God created them male and female, whereas Jesus said a man and a woman will leave their parents and become one flesh. Mm -hmm. If you don't believe that, 
then, then it's real easy to support what every revolutionary movement can serve to abolish the present state of things. Right. 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 So, so they were on board for this. The communists were way before liberals were. And so I point all this all this out in my book Takedown, which um, is one of those books now that people are using against me and they don't even read it. And and I say in that book, as a liberal, all right, you might still read this book and say, well, okay, all right, professor, you make your case here, okay. But I still support same sex marriage. Well, fine, okay. But I'm just telling you that um, they were there before you, and the reasons why they wanted to go there should bother you. Right. Right. It really ought to bother you. And, it really ought to give you pause. Yeah. And, right? and, and it really and should. Cause and, you to think and, twice yeah. about about what what's convinced you of that position. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so they um, and so I've had people to I've seen people say he says that the communists gave us same sex marriage. You know, no, I no, I, 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 I don't say that. You, you, you have um, you have people moving in different directions, all these different forces moving in these different directions. And whatever movement is pushing for same sex marriage, right? The communists come along and they're like, oh, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. I mean, yeah, you know, like we've that. been we've been trying to we've been trying to argue for 150 years that there's no such thing as moral bi biblical absolutes, mm -hmm. right? We've been going against biblical law, law natural law, Judeo-Christian. Yeah. Okay, and we've been trying to, we've been calling for abolition of the family. We've been calling for all the, we haven't been able to do it. This will do it. Yeah. Right? right. This is the vehicle. This is the, this is the Trojan horse yeah. and, that we can use. That's where I get nailed too, Joe. Like, he calls straight back marriage a Trojan horse by communists, right? It, it's, it's like, no, they, they, they look at this and they say, this is the vehicle finally, right? Yeah. This is what we can. We couldn't get it on our own. We can get it now, yeah. right? And we can get it with majority support. Mm -hmm. Whoa, right? Right. And that's 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 why they jumped on it in the early two thousands. And and you you see the commonality there. And we don't unfortunately have time to get into uh, an extended discourse on uh, on this theme in your book. But um, towards the end, you mentioned how um, Satan is functioning as or at least this is what i you can tell me if i'm i'm wrong in my conclusion this is what you're saying satan is functioning as the um anonymous power behind this movement and you know i was getting like strong uh vibes like c.s lewis vibes that hideous strength you know he's um you know, Satan is obviously not physically manifested somewhere on earth. It's not like he's, you know, reigning on some infernal throne, you know, on the South Pole or something. But, but you know, if we hold to the biblical worldview, Christian worldview, he's real and he inspires movements and he whispers in people's ear and he, he tempts people and he preys on sin. And it kind of makes sense that on one hand, you'd have this movement against biblical sexual norms, familial norms. On the other hand, you'd have this movement that just opposes all of God's structures and, you know, wants to elevate man as a God. It, it makes sense that those two movements would find each other and would sort of latch onto each other. And you, you sort of see that anonymous power at work. Is that, is that your sense of, of how that yeah. worked? There's this um, this really intriguing imagery by um, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth talks about the anonymous power of fads and fashion, right? Yeah, yeah that's Where what I'm thinking. Like of. the prevailing zeitgeist, the mood that's out there, the the spirit of the age that's that's blowing around, and and he points out that it was the same anonymous power that when Christ was up there in front of Pontius Pilate prompted the people who a week earlier ago had been shouting hosannas and laying out the palms and welcoming him into Jerusalem and into their homes. Now suddenly they're yelling, crucify him, crucify him. And Benedict XVI said, who are they? We didn't even know the names of any of the people who were yelling that. They're anonymous, right? And there's kind of this anonymous power of fads and fashion out there in the world that's just kind of, you can't even identify. You hear this all the time, right? Um, this person was canceled on Twitter. And you ask yourself, well, who canceled them? Who? Who has the power to cancel you, right? There's a, a Twitter lynching. Well, by who? Who's right. doing it? Right. I was, I'd, I'd like to create a website called um, um, Canceling the Cancel Culture, right? Mm. It, it, call out the people who are canceling people. Who are they? We don't even know who they are. Yeah. It's just like they're anonymous. It's like this yeah. anonymous power 
that, that, that's that you can't even pin it down. You'd stop it if you could pin them down and find out who it was and call them out. In yeah. fact, a lot of these people, when you smoke them out and you find out publicly who's behind is attacking you, right? And 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 then their names are out there in public. Then they back off. They thrive on 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 on, on uh, anonymity. And so I don't know to what degree this is a, you know, a satanic influence or 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 whatever. But uh, but 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 it's 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 chilling and it and it's it's um, you know it's out there in the culture. Yeah, yeah. No, that's good. I, th- thanks, thanks for tying in the the modern cancel culture with that. I think it, that's it's, gonna be really it's hard too. It's hard to know, right? All of this is complicated, and which is why it it, it it's painful to when you put ideas out there in kind of long books to see people sum them up in a sentence or two. Yeah. It's like, why am I wasting my time? You know. Yeah. Uh, but 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 a lot of these things, it's always hard to say A gave us B, right? C led to D, E, E, and F, right? Um, it's always hard, but but like with Marx, maybe we can't say and know if the guy was a Satanist, was 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 demonically possessed, but we can know looking at this that this is bad, this is disturbing, this is chilling. That's all absolutely undeniable. And for people, Marx defenders who say, um, I quote one of them in the book, said, it is absurd to blame Marx for the, for the gulag, right? Really? You're going to call you're going to call for the abolition of private property and all the other things that Marx calls for. You don't think people are going to resist right. when they come to take your business and your farm right. and your house and all your and all your private stuff. You think people are just going to lay down and say, oh, well, we love communism too. take it. I, 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 and. And, and right then and there, even if you support that idea, you got to stop and think to yourself, well, I'd like to do that. I'd love to take away all their stuff. I really would. But, um, you know, people are going to resist and you have to kill a lot of people. And right. man, it's just not it's a non-starter. Right. It's a non-starter. <laughs> it's a dumb idea. And people think they can't realize that. I, I don't I, I, I don't know. I don't know why they can't realize it. But it's just see, it's obvious. It's common yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, man. I I would love to to just keep going on this conversation, Paul. Uh, uh, Doctor Ken. I I feel like I I should call you Doctor Kengor since since you're my professor. Whatever you want to call me is fine. I've been called a lot worse. That's fair. That's fair. Uh, so Slam RN now um, on YouTube, and maybe we can just take one or two questions. Sure. Uh, Slam RN is asking this: What about globalists? Where do they come in? Are they using the Marxists to take down economies so that a new world order can come in? What's, what's your thought on that? Is there a connection between Marxism and globalism? Well, I guess it depends on which globalist you're talking about, right? And and there's um, uh, there's the Great Reset that's going on right now. Yeah. And the author of that, his book is literally called The Great Reset. Mm-hmm. And they're part of a, a weird group of kind of global international capitalists who yet support everything from some forms of woke capitalism to even some forms of socialism. It's really weird who who some of this stuff appeals to. And uh, I think a lot of a lot of that stems too from Western European elements and variants of socialist thought, democratic socialism, which is completely different from social democracy, by the way. But um, so, yeah, depending on which globalist you're talking about, but a lot of them, Joel, they have a kind of an, an impulse and desire to manage. That's what it comes down to. Right. They're, they're kind of, they see themselves as elite managers to manage people, to manage things. And yeah. I often hear people say, don't they realize that if they did this, how this would hurt everything and hurt them? too? No, because because they're going to exempt themselves from everything else everybody else, right? They're going to have the dacha on the Black Sea. Yeah, you know, c- Communism is for the masses, not the masters, right? It's for the right. ruled, not the rulers. Right. Yeah, right. The Green New Deal and AOC, they might ban air travel from, from, from the West Coast to the East Coast and make all the serfs ta- <laughs> ta- take, take Amtrak, all right? Yeah. Um, what they're going to give up flying in an airplane? No, they're not going to give up. No chance. Right. No, 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 no. That's for everybody else. Right. And we That's saw that during the, the lockdowns of the last year. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Helpful. Um, one more question. This is coming from Nate Werner. Uh, Nate says, why was Marx pro people being armed? So uh, c- can you verify that? Was Marx in favor of 
uh, what he might call the masses being I, armed? I don't know. I don't know if that's true. I got to plead ignorance here. Okay. Uh, I mean, he did call for the forcible overthrow. That's what I'm. That's what I'm wondering <laughs> yeah, if it of was all tied existing to that. social conditions. But I don't know where Marx stood on that stuff. I mean, there are groups out there like the Democratic Socialists of America have a, have a group called the Socialist Rifle Association. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or the John there Brown, are, there's a John Brown Rifle Club too, or something like that. I think. Yeah, and and I mean, you know, socialists and Marxists and communists have always been about, and maybe this answers a question. Um, they've always been about arming in the order to overthrow. Um, the the powers and to and plus in order to if you read through the ten point plan on the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels right then and there right they say abolition of property and land, um, abolition of all right of inheritance, um, institution of graduated progressive income tax, more equitable distribution of the population across right. the countryside, right. and they even say in there of course in the beginning despotic inroads will be necessary right. in order to do this. They yeah. knew. That you were going to need guns and gulags yeah to, to be able to because people aren't just going to lay down and give up their stuff they're not dumb so you so you might have you know a 19 year old in starbucks today sipping on a grand latte saying well this sounds pretty cool i think we can do this right, right? this is, but we'll do it peacefully too marks and Engels look it, 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 at least looked at what they what they did and realized that it was completely contrary to human nature <laughs> that you, you were going to need Lenin knew right. Stalin knew you were going to you're going to Trotsky we will not arrive in the kingdom of socialism with white gloves on a polished floor right blood's going to have to be spilled they weren't stupid what's amazing is there are the people today who look at this and say wow this communist manifesto is a pretty good book I think this would work really nice right uh no the no the 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 communists from the from the late 1800s early 1900s realized they were going to have to kill people Watch the, the Larry Grathwall uh, recording online where he talks about meeting underground. He penetrated the weather underground, mm. meeting with um, members of the weather underground and them talking about implementing a communist government in the United States and saying that they would have to kill something like 20 to 25 million people in the United States in order to do this. And the people who would resist, they would put in the relocation concentration camps in the American Southwest. I mean, they were dumb. They realized, Castro realized, Che realized, you're going to have to kill people in order to in order to implement this insane ideology of Marxism, yeah. which is why it should be dead and no yeah. one should be following it. Yeah. Um, one last quick comment here. This is coming from Bill McPherson on YouTube. He says that Leninists were pro stripping people's arms. He flipped everything as the lower class never raised up. So the elites had to implement it. Does that sound right? Yeah. Well, yeah, I think that's true. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, you had to. Um, you had to disarm the population. I mean, they were in favor of arming the Cheka, the NKVD, right? The KGB, the these GRU. Are, yeah, uh, uprising fronts. These are these are revolutionary groups. Right. Well, that well that too. Yeah. So the cadre, um, you know, the the revolutionaries, the people to to um, to go against the czar, to go against the powers that be, to overthrow the government, that was going to require weaponry. And then, of course, the, the you know the really dirty secret. Once they came into power, uh, knowing that people would resist their ideas, and that they would have to implement a dictatorship in order to try to keep the idea in. No communist ever has free and fair elections. Right. All right. right. Uh, when when Poland held free and fair elections in June 1989, they opened up 100 seats. The communist communist lost 100 out of 100 seats. Wow. So in order to maintain the power, once you're in. You have to have a, 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 a giant armed security force, mm -hmm. the Stasi in East Germany, the Securitat in Romania, the AVH, all these other different groups, Hungary, Poland. I mean, that's how it had to be. Okay. Okay. Um, man, Dr. Kangor, thank you so much for coming on. Um, really enriching conversation. And, um, you know, I, I appreciated the way that you contrasted the Marxist view with the biblical anthropology and the biblical you know, origin story, which is, a, I believe, a true story. Um, you know, that's, that's the message I'm getting out is that the Bible is true and therefore anything opposing scripture and the biblical worldview is necessarily false. And because God is a good God, if you oppose God, you necessarily align yourself with evil, unfortunately. I think that's it what It all we've starts seen. with that same mistake, right? For yeah. in, in the Garden of Eden, right? Ye yeah. shall be as gods. You become yeah. your own rule maker, your own God. Yeah. And as Dostoevsky said, if God does not exist, everything is permissible. Right, 
Right. Yeah. Harrowing words. Uh, probably probably a, a, a fitting quote to end with. Um, mm-hmm. Let me just encourage all of our viewers and listeners. By the way, if you're listening on the podcast later on, thank you so much for listening. And uh, please go ahead and give us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, hit that subscribe button and make sure you hit the bell so that you don't miss a minute of this excellent, I believe, if I do say so myself, this excellent content that we're putting out. And speaking of excellent um, Dr. Kengor, this was uh, magnificent. I, I I really, really appreciate it. Thank you for writing this book. Thank you for, for coming on. And um, we're going to put this out on the audio podcast later. I'll tag you and everything. And, and um, I really think this is going to be very helpful to a lot of people. So I uh, appreciate the work that you do. Oh, and uh, where can people find your book, The Devil and Karl Marx? Oh, thanks, Joel. Yeah, just go to Amazon. And also, you can follow me at our faithandfreedom.com. That's the web institute, the, the the website for the Institute for Faith and Freedom. And I have a regular column for the American Spectator, which is spectator.org. So you can sign up and get my columns there if you like. But you're very okay, so, kind. Thank you. Oh, of course, of course. So, um, faith and freedom. dot com and spectator. dot org. Um, go check out those websites. Go pick up this book. It's a hard read. It's a it's a scholarly read. It's beneficial, but there are parts of it that are very dark. I recommend praying before and after you read, and right. I recommend and I recommend reading scripture before and afterwards as well, yes. be- because uh, because put on the Mark, full armor of God. Yeah. That's right. Amen. Amen. But remember, I it was worse for me writing it. Believe me, I I can only imagine. I can only <laughs> imagine. All right, Doctor Kangaroo, thanks so much. I know you got a lot of other stuff going on today, so uh, God bless you. Thanks for your time. Th- same to you, Joel. Thanks. God bless. All right, well, this has been another episode of the Think Podcast with Joel Sedeckes. I really enjoyed this conversation. I sure hope that you found something helpful, heard something helpful. I know I certainly did. So um, if you would, take a moment and think about uh, what we just talked about. And while you're thinking about that, perhaps you might want to prayerfully consider partnering with the Think Institute and with the work that we're doing. And there's a very simple way you can do that. You can go to give dot cru dot org slash one zero one eight eight four one that's give dot crew dot org slash one zero one eight eight four one i am a support raising missionary through crew through a non-woke bible-centered gospel forward division of crew called church movements and the think institute everything that you see from the blog to the podcast to the in-church trainings to the courses that we offer through the hammer and anvil society it's all under crew church movements which i just want to specify again non-woke bible-centered gospel forward we believe the gospel and we believe that the gospel is the solution to all the bad ideas out there, Marxism included. And not only that, but it's the gospel of Jesus Christ that is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. If you've been listening to this podcast, you've heard that uh, my voice is kind of suffering right now. So thank you for suffering along with me. I know, uh, I'm I'm sure that you found something uh, helpful. So um, uh, thanks for listening. Follow us on all the social media, subscribe if you haven't done so. And again, perhaps you might want to prayerfully consider partnering with us at give.crew.org slash 101-8841. Thank you so much to all of you who do support us. Thank you for the kind words. Thanks for engaging. Those of you who left comments I couldn't respond to, uh, forgive me. Uh, but understand we get a lot of comments that come in across all the different media where we, we post this and uh, can't always get to all of them. But um, on, a con- on an episode like this, I knew you wanted to hear from Dr. Ken Gore, so I wanted to let him really speak. Um, so remember, this is not goodbye. This has just been a little pit stop along the way of your spiritual journey. One more thing I just forgot to mention. I am going to be going to the Cruciform Conference. The theme is Still Standing. It's going to be outside of Indianapolis, Pennsylvania. It's actually in Indianapolis, Pennsylvania, June 4th and 5th, 2021. And I'm going to be talking at the pre-conference on uh, the topic of the apologetics of Jesus and the apostles. So uh, if if you're uh, interested in that, you're going to be in the Indianapolis area, or even if you're not, consider coming to the Cruciform Conference the five, it, it's still standing, the 500th anniversary of the Diet of Worms. So check that out. You can go to cruciformministries.org and uh, find the information there. All right. Now, that about wraps it up for me. Thanks again for watching. Thanks for listening. Until next time.
I hope it made you think.